This month on The Card Life, presented by Loop. And I'm the creator of the 1989 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. card. I was 18 and I made a card of a 19 year old. I have over 4,500 Ricky Henderson items and most of those are cards. I bought a fake Mario Lemieux rookie card. I was scammed out of that. I decided I need to become more educated on the fakes. Welcome back to The Card Life. I'm Matt Strong coming at you today from San Diego. And on this episode, we have some awesome hobby stories related to the state of California. We'll introduce you to a California native who created one of the most iconic sports cards in history and did it when he was just 18 years old. You'll also see an incredible collection dedicated to a Hall of Famer who spent his peak years in Oakland. I do not collect duplicates, so everything has to be unique. We'll also talk with the author of a book on spotting counterfeit sports cards. Up first, we travel back in time to the late 80s in Anaheim, California and tell you the incredible story of Tom Guideman and Upper Deck. I'm Tom Guideman, and I'm the creator of the 1989 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. card. While in high school in the late 1980s, Tom Guideman worked at a card shop in Anaheim called Upper Deck. A chance encounter in that shop became a monumental moment in sports card history. One of the days that I wasn't working at the card shop, there's a gentleman named Paul Sumner who needed trading cards for his son's friend's birthday party or something like that. Paul had a background in very high quality printing, color separations. Where Paul worked, Orbis in Anaheim, they did the color separations for Architectural Digest. So Paul, not knowing anything about sports, walks into this upper deck card shop and he's looking at the cards and he's like, these are terrible. Like the printing is awful on these cards. And so they started chatting with each other and one thing came to another and they decided to start their own trading card company. When those two were talking, the two founders, Paul Sumner and Bill Hemrick, the co-owner of the card shop, they brought me into the fold because of my kind of rookie stockbroker mentality. I could tell who were the up and coming rookies and just my knowledge about baseball and my love of trading cards. And I was cheap because I was like 17, so. <laughs> and actually I was the first person ever hired at Upper Deck. The day after I graduated high school, started working there. Tom's first task at Upper Deck in June of 1988, organize a first year set. And this is the potential set combinations that would have made up the 1989 Upper Deck set. What I was proposing the set should consist of, the 26 number one draft picks, checklist for the number one draft picks, 26 team sets, consisting of 24 cards per team. They anointed me to just come up with the entire set. So it was my responsibility to figure out who was going to be in it, what subsets were going to be in it. I created all that stuff on my old Macintosh computer that my parents bought me for college. With four major card companies already holding licenses with Major League Baseball, acquiring the rights was a difficult task for the startup. Two California Angel players ended up playing a role in making it all happen. Dwayne Bice was a rookie relief pitcher, and he was kind of a journeyman minor leaguer. And he happened to walk into the strip mall where the Upper Deck card shop was located. There was a Chinese food place right next to the Upper Deck card shop. And he walked in, placed his order, and then walked over to the card shop and was joking around about, where's my rookie card? How much is my rookie card worth? So he started talking to the owner of the card shop they brought on Dwayne Weiss. They had his number in the Rolodex. And uh, Dwayne introduced them to the California Angels, where he was a pitcher, and Wally Joyner, who was the star player for the Angels. So he got Wally to come aboard and become the other prototype card. So the prototype cards are Dwayne Weiss and Wally Joyner. All the Angels allowed them to make prototype cards using their logo for $1. The Players Association said, you can't be an owner of a company who's a licensee. So Dwayne Weiss, who had an ownership stake, pretty significant one, and Wally Joyner, they ended up reaching deals. Joyner and his agent settled for what's basically, I mean, then it was a lot of money, 
but now in hindsight, it's a pretty paltry sum. And Dwayne Weiss ended up selling his shares back for millions of dollars. Up next, the creation of 1989 Upper Deck. Card number one, star rookie Ken Griffey Jr. Why bother with empty shelves at retail stores, waiting three days for a break to fill, or driving across town to find out your hobby shop closed at four when you always have a card show in your pocket? With Loop, you can instantly buy cards, packs, boxes, or into auctions with the click of a button and do it all while chatting with some of the best personalities and the best community in the hobby. Download the Loop app now on iOS or Android. Loop, a card show in your pocket. Loop is proud to be the presenting sponsor of The Card Life. Here are some of the best break hits from the last month. Boo! Let's go! All it takes is one out of 15! Juan Soto, Ronald Acuna Oh Peter, my goodness. Cool auto. One of five. One of five. That's oh. a monster. Join the Loop community now by downloading the app on iOS or Android. Loop, a card show in your pocket. This is the sketch I had done. So this was the card back for the star rookies. This was the sketch that they used to make all super pretty and nice. Ken Griffey Jr. had just won single A player of the year. I had figured there's no way this 19-year-old guy, who is a 1987 number one overall draft pick, there's no way he's going to come in 1989 and make the Major League squad. He only had 17 games in AA, nothing above that. My thought was, Griffey is going to go to the minor leagues. He's going to probably start at AA, be a mid-season September call-up, and then eventually he was going to be the guy that everybody was going to seek out. As luck would have it, he ended up making the Major League roster opening day and had a fantastic career from there. VJ Lavero is probably one of the greatest sports photographers of all time. He was the Angels team photographer and he was Sports Illustrated's West Coast photographer. So Sports Illustrated that year, in 1988, had sent VJ to go shoot Class A San Bernardino Spirit. So that was VJ's shot that it just happened to be, uh, he shot this amazingly beautiful high quality photo. And the way it was shot, he, he framed it in his lens. So he had cropped it right above where it says spirit on his shirt. And then right above his hat, holding the bat, wearing his gold chain and his navy turtleneck. It's just the perfect shot. As a teenager in charge of organizing the upper deck set each year, Guideman did what any other kid that age would do. Add some fun and previously unrevealed quirks to the set each year. I would go through and assemble the cards into card numbers. Growing up as an Angels fan, I put the Kirk Gibson commemorative home run card from the 88 World Series at card 666. And then every year after that, a Dodger appeared at card 666. And ironically, they didn't win a World Series for 31 years. And I'm an equal opportunity person. If it's funny, I'm just gonna do it. Bill Buckner is kind of known for, besides being an amazing hitter, but he's known for the 1986 Red Sox, a ball kind of booting through his bow legs. So I had gotten this photo from one of our photographers and they're looking across the diamond and there's Bill Buckner then playing for the Kansas City Royals. The tarp that they use to roll out in case it rains, there's a giant hole of this tarp, ironically, in the middle of Bill Buckner's legs. Of course, I had to use it. After six years at Upper Deck, Guideman headed to the East Coast to work for another card company, Scoreboard. He later partnered with a longtime friend to form a company still making cards in the hobby, Sage. This is the first ever trading card of LeBron James. Guideman once again was able to use his talents to identify young stars. Kobe Bryant in 1998, Aaron Rodgers in 2005, 
but he did have one miss in 2000. There was a young quarterback from Michigan who really wasn't good enough to start at Michigan. That young player, Tom Brady, ended up being considered like a late round draft pick. So when it came time to negotiate his deal, I figured, well, is a late round pick. He's just a filler for a set. So we had offered him a dollar an autograph. His agent came back and said, we want a dollar 25 an autograph. And I thought, he's a filler. We'll get somebody else to throw in for a dollar. So we passed on him. <laughs> Overall, it's been an incredible hobby journey for someone who started it days after his high school graduation. The thing that I'm the most proud of are all the innovations that went into the trading cards. I created the die cut cards with the SP cards in 93. We had the very first autograph in a pack in 1990. I was the first one to introduce digital printing, the tamper resistant foil pack, doing vintage cards in packs, autograph per pack products. The um, sticker autograph, I actually created the patent for that. Seeing those innovations in the trading cards, that's, that brings me a lot of satisfaction. Up next, an Oakland A's legend and one fan's Man Cave of Steel. Tired of paying 10%, 15% or more to sell your cards, comics, and digital collectibles? How does 1% sound? Too good to be true? Well, not anymore. MySlabs.com is the web's premier user-driven marketplace for buying and selling slabbed cards, sealed wax, and now slab comics and digital collectibles. So the next time you're forced to pay 10% or more to sell something from your collection, head over to MySlabs.com and join the 1% revolution. Welcome back to The Card Life presented by Loot. While Ricky Henderson played for nine different teams in his 25 seasons, he had four separate stints with his original team, the Oakland A's. In Olathe, Kansas, the best leadoff hitter and base runner in baseball history is celebrated by Kent Corser in his Man Cave of Steel. You are standing in the Man Cave of Steel. Love all started actually with uh, a set of cards. I remember walking downstairs and seeing a brown box underneath the Christmas tree. It was a complete set of 1987 tops. And sure enough, as I started to go through those cards, there was a ton of Ricky Hendersons between like his base card, the all-star card, a checklist card, a turn back the clock card. And I literally kind of paused and thought to myself, this guy must be really good. And it really kind of started from there. This is a 1982 Topps card made out of a variety of sports cards. Having a signed base, just absolutely amazing. Ricky doesn't sign bases, so the fact that this kind of came together through a Steiner signing that wasn't supposed to happen. I have over 4,500 Ricky Henderson items, um, and most of those are cards, right? All the way from 1977 to, you know, just yesterday. I get as many as I can. I do not collect duplicates, so everything has to be unique um, other than his rookie card. All the plastic that you see all lined up are all Ricky Henderson rookies. I have about 50 Ricky Henderson rookies. I collect what I like. I collect what I like from the pictures, even colors, right? So any green specific card of Ricky, any color match of any jersey, I really, really like. So. I've learned to really hone in on the very specific things that I like, and so that makes it more of a hunt, but a fun niche. I call this actually the heart of the Man Cave of Steel. The cards is the foundation of the collection. As a kid, I always wanted to walk into a card store and just see an entire case of Ricky Henderson. And of course, that never was a thing. So I recreated that, and now it's a thing. I have a lot of autograph cards in here, or just a lot of uh, rare inserts. Maybe the holy grail of the collection is a game-worn shoe from the early 80s, one of the early year Mizuno cleats, and Ricky signed it with an early year inscription. And actually, I recently got that within the last year. This is actually Ricky's first ever from 2002 Donruss, it's Redemption. That was his first ever certified autograph that came in cards. So we had to wait till 2002 to get a Ricky Henderson autograph on a card. And of course, he started in 79. I currently have 12 one of ones. I mean, here's a one of one. This is um, this is a card art piece from 2020 Topps Museum die cut. So that was this is actually a card that was painted physically on. So super cool. And then yeah, just a Ricky out of 10 hanging out in the bottom. I don't pick favorites per se, but 
of course the 1980 rookie card is just without a doubt is one of the most iconic cards ever i love 1987 tops because again that's where it started the 1977 chong minor league card is a white whale it's actually one of the rarest minor league cards of any player that was a multi-year hunt and to this day of course is one of my favorite cards as well the skateboard is by an artist named aaron hill it's just an absolute incredible piece incredible detail and so inside of here is all art cards and these are all custom art cards. Like here's one that looks like a Mizuno batting glove, you know, themed border. You know, here's one with an embedded baseball. I mean, just absolutely incredible stuff. That to me is what's still so exciting is that even today with everything that I have, let alone what others have, I'm still finding new stuff all the time. It's endless. And he played for so long and in so many different cities. It's really, really cool. Why bother with empty shelves at retail stores, waiting three days for a break to fill, or driving across town to find out your hobby shop closed at four when you always have a card show in your pocket? With Loop, you can instantly buy cards, packs, boxes, or into auctions with the click of a button and do it all while chatting with some of the best personalities and the best community in the hobby. Download the Loop app now on iOS or Android. Loop, a card show in your pocket. This is for every girl who hears people say she won't make it, but refuses to listen. For every girl who thinks not about what she has to lose, but about what she has to gain. This is for every girl who doesn't look like everyone who's come before, but may look like those who will follow. This is for every diamond in the sky. This is for every girl. LPGA professionals are filled with an enduring determination to succeed. Every drive, every putt, every win is the result of years of hard work. At Gainbridge, we know your hard work should be rewarded just like the pros. Our innovative, self-managed online platform puts our clients in control with easy access to manage their investments. Begin maximizing your income for as little as $1,000. Gain access, gain control. Gainbridge. Start now at Gainbridge.life. Tired of paying 10%, 15% or more to sell your cards, comics, and digital collectibles? How does 1% sound? Too good to be true? Well, not anymore. MySlabs.com is the web's premier user-driven marketplace for buying and selling slabbed cards, sealed wax, and now, slab comics and digital collectibles. So the next time you're forced to pay 10% or more to sell something from your collection, head over to MySlabs.com and join the 1% revolution. Loop is proud to be the presenting sponsor of The Card Life. Here are some of the best break hits from the last month. Iron Mike Tyson. Blue Cracked Ice 10 of 10. Who is it? Trevor Lawrence. 101. Let's go, baby. Join the Loop community now by downloading the app on iOS or Android. Loop, a card show in your pocket. Last year, Ryan Nolan of Breakout Cards released his book, Spotting Fakes, that examined the top 50 fake cards across the hobby. Counterfeit cards have always been a problem since the invention of sports cards, but modern technology and the millions of dollars pouring into the hobby have made it an increasing problem in recent years. Last January, I was at a card show in Florida and I bought a fake Mario Lemieux rookie card and I was scammed out of that. And when that happened, I decided I need to become more educated on the fakes and start learning about all these different cards because I'm going to card shows every single weekend. I need to educate myself. So I started making videos almost every single week about what makes a card real or fake. And as I did that, I'd go to shows, I'd talk to different dealers and experts that have been cards for 20, 30, 40 years, seeing their examples of fakes, and then writing down notes what they were talking about. And last year I went to 52 shows, so I got notes from a bunch of dealers all across the US, published it in December, and super happy about that. In your book, you talk about the five simple rules. Can you go over those quick? So the first one would be knowing the card stock. Different set with sports cards in general has their own way of printing. Older cards tend to be thicker, where newer cards today 
are thinner. Obviously, there's Chrome cards. With older cards, you can actually put a flashlight to them. No light should be passing on older cards like an old Judge or an Allen Ginter. There's other cards with a little bit of light. There's other cards that does show light and ones that fail it. But just knowing like how thick the card is itself is super important, how the card feels, because that's the hardest part for a counterfeiter to do is reproduce the card stuff. Now, the second thing on there, the printing. What I'd recommend before you purchase a super expensive card raw is to buy a loop. They're not too expensive. People creating reprints today often just photocopy the card and aren't able to reproduce the same exact printing patterns because a lot of the counterfeits are pixelated, whereas the old ones are not. A super easy way is to actually smell the card because over time it gets all the different smells of the aging and nothing smells like a vintage card. It's always important to take a look at another card in a set. You don't have to have the same expensive card. I have an example here of a Tom Seaver that's been graded. Another Matt from 1970. You can see that's a five, looks pretty sharp. And I have a counterfeit here of the Johnny Bench. So if you compare the real to the fake, for sure, you can see the color of the borders off. So when you're going to a show and you're gonna spend money on a super expensive card, go around and see if a vintage dealer has a common. That way you can bring it over to that deal and inspect both cards at the same time because the flaws really become obvious. When purchasing online, make sure someone has a lot of good reviews and feedback. See what they've sold in the past. They're always changing ways people are skimming on whether it's marketplaces or even at shows. It's all about doing your research. I'm assuming you've been going to shows your whole life. You said you've been collecting forever. So this past year, I've seen 52 shows. What does it tell you about the state of the hobby right now? The hobby has never been more alive. Card values over the last six months might have declined. But if you look at the last five or 10 years, how much farther the hobby has gone, it's a really, really positive direction. Why bother with empty shelves at retail stores, waiting three days for a break to fill, or driving across town to find out your hobby shop closed at four when you always have a card show in your pocket? With Loop, you can instantly buy cards, packs, boxes, or into breaks with the click of a button. And do it all while chatting with some of the best personalities and the best community in the hobby. Download the Loop app now on iOS or Android. Loop, a card show in your pocket. SportsCards.com is the official sponsor and online store of The Card Life and supplier of the packs and boxes I rip every month. Thank you to SportsCards.com again for this uh, another break here. Topps Tech 1999 Major League Baseball and this one is real interesting. The checklist is huge. It's over 2,500. This checklist is a spreadsheet. So you got all, you got 30 of the variations and then the 45 names. So, should be an interesting rip, and uh, let's get into it. There we go. North Dakota legend right there, Darren Erstead. The backs are just as shiny as the front. Jason Kendall, unbelievable human. I was very fortunate to get to know him in Kansas City. My third, fourth week in the big leagues, and I got done pitching in like the six, come into the clubhouse, and I got changed to do all my arm care, ice, whatever. And I'm sitting at my locker in like the top of the ninth, and uh, Kendall walks in and just rips me a new one. Like, what are you doing in here, rookie? Like, about as Jason Kendall as you can get. And I was like, all right, I'm sorry. Like, I was like, I didn't know. And then he's like, no, he's like, go be a teammate, all this. I was like, okay, sweet. So I did. And then the next day he came up to me. He's like, hey, you handled that really well. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, you're a 14 year vet. Whatever you tell me, you tell me to jump, I'll ask how high. Cal Ripken. Is that gold? Yeah, number 10. I was like, this is the only one that you can't see through. And then it looked like there was something on the front. When they stamped it, they pushed the stamp all the way through the card almost. Numbered to 10, very nice. Todd, how, we got another numbered card to 10 here. Scott, roll. Another gold, number five of 10. Sweet. Well, two gold hits out of there with Scott Rowland and Cal Ripken Jr., both numbered to 10. 
It's really cool.